Welcome to Best of Day ACG 2016. This is the fourth and final part of our series. My name is Miguel Ruggiero, I'm Professor of Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. And today I'm joined by Dr. Susie Kane, who's Professor of Medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. So Susie, in, in part four, um, we were talking a minute ago, there were some interesting abstracts. What did, you, what did you take away or what did you find? So there was an interesting study looking at the concept of a rapid infusion mm -hmm. for infliximab. We know that patients tolerate two hours very well. That seems to be standard across basically the world. Right. But can you do it faster? And so the, the folks at Houston Methodist prospectively asked all of their patients, so it was 120 patients, mm -hmm. whether they would be willing to try a faster infusion schedule, so 60 minutes, so basically half the time. Right. And then they were able to retrospectively compare those who said yes to those who declined the offer. And interestingly, it was very well tolerated mm. doing it at 60 minutes. They did have several patients who subjectively had some symptoms that were not well documented, but patient preference basically drove the decision to go back to the 120 right. minutes. There, uh, there, it, there were no signals in terms of whether it was Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, any kind of, of sex, or whether you were on um, a, a co-immunomodulator like yep. combination, whether pre-meds were on board or not. So I think that, that there are several reasons, whether it's for patient experience, convenience, and then clearly, from a health economic standpoint, right. there would be advantages to doing it that way, that, that they were able to save over 7,000 minutes. Wow. <laughs> and that equated to about uh, 121 hours. And if you put that into FTE or nursing time or whichever infusion rent whatever Let that alone clearly to the patient what that means exactly yeah. the yeah the opportunity cost to the patient right. that clearly this is a good direction to be heading certainly the pediatrician world the pediatric yeah, world yeah. wants to hear yep. whether this is safe to do because the kids should be in school the parents should be at work and that the the stakes may be even higher for them in terms of being able to do it faster. I will say that this was an infusion center study. Right, so right. this was not done in the patient's homes right. and looking to see whether it could be done faster. And so that came up in the discussion, yep, yep. whether now that if patients were doing it at home, which is a trend in certain insurance carriers, yep. that this was not condoned or even studied that at home you could do it in a rapid fashion. Right. This is still in an infusion center at a hospital-based you know, facility. And, and so even though it maybe it could be, it's clear and important to point out that this was done in an infusion center. So I think the, um, the interesting aspects I'm hearing with this are that we can get faster with our infusions, with infliximab now, with the experience we have they showed that not 120 minutes, but even 60 minutes. And as you said, no real serious adverse events related to the infusions. I think they mentioned too that they give an antihistamine and acetaminophen, but these right. weren't patients getting you know, whopping right. doses of steroids right. to get them through, they did well. Right. And I know in my practice, we're starting to move to these 60 minute infusions. And I think you mentioned that you're starting to consider a look at that as well. Right. Um, so very clinically relevant. Exactly. So let's, um, what else did you find? I know there were a couple others that you mentioned uh, that, that right. caught your eye. So there was a, a, an intriguing study out of Cleveland Clinic, mm -hmm. and actually Magic Risk, who is the first author on this paper, is not an ibd -er per se, right. but he is uh, very interested in quality improvement, yep. and I think that that's where this stemmed from. So, you know, we, we talked a little bit about health economics with the yeah. rapid infusions, that clearly hospital readmission rates are associated with quality metrics that are looked at from the payer standpoint as well as from the government right. standpoint. So we know that hospital readmission for the diabetics, for the CHF, for the COPD are important and costly. Well, how about the IBD population? Right. So Cleveland Clinic has a very large system, is a large system, has a lot of IBD patients and a lot of hospital admissions. So over a two-year span, they looked at patients who were readmitted within 30 days right. of their hospital discharge and why. 
were there any kind of signals or variables that could predict yep. who was going to get readmitted. So this was a prospective study looking at a long time frame of patients who were in a, yes, a tertiary care practice, so maybe sickest of the sick, right. but that are at high risk for high cost care, right? right? So you want to try to predict, if you can, in a, in a reliable, predict, prospective way, who you might want to spend more time with and not necessarily just kick to the curb. And, and like you said, why they're coming back. And to, why are they yeah. coming back? So it was very interesting that they, that they identified seven variables mm -hmm. in their model. And four of those seven had to do directly with pain. Huh, okay. If you were admitted with, for pain, if you were having a flare with active disease documented, whether you were treated with narcotics right. during that hospitalization, and if you were sent home or discharged on pain medicine, so four out of the yeah. out of the seven. So clearly, there's a theme here that pain pain matters, pain matters and it drives outcome, and also likely cost and healthcare utilization. Right. So it sounds like the the take homes that I'm hearing from what you're saying are that they they've come up with this interesting index, this readmission to the hospital predictive index and it's validated, they're starting to validate it. Maybe right. this will be a tool that we'll all use as part of our electronic health records and systems that will kind of flag us in a way in the future. And they started to identify some of these risk factors for readmission. And I think pain's an interesting one, and, and right. the narcotic piece of this too is it's playing a big role. So very interesting study. Like you said, economically, this is an important study from an insurance standpoint, important as well. So. Right. So good. So let's. Um, what else? What else did you find, Miguel? I'll actually turn the question back to you. All right. That there was a very in interesting study that I found uh, talking about medical home. But because this is from your institution and you have been so an integral part of this whole concept and this study, that I want to hear from the horse's oh. mouth about this okay. and share with everybody what was happening there. Great. Well, so well, thanks for asking. <laughs> um, and I think, as you alluded to, this was a patient-centered medical home model. So we mentioned a minute ago about predictive readmission risk factors. We're looking at these new models of care. And really this is a specialty medical home. We're used to the primary care medical mm -hmm. homes where the gastroenterologist, myself and my colleagues, become the principal care provider for that patient, almost okay. really the primary care provider. Hmm. And what we did is we set out with our own health plan. So we have an integrated health plan system within Pittsburgh and UPMC. And we looked at how can we take care of the whole patient, whole patient care with a team that includes psychiatrists, social worker, nutritionists, gastroenterologists, surgeons, this whole team looking at taking care of the whole patient and ultimately decreasing cost and decreasing utilization. So the primary outcomes of the study we're interested in are one, could we enroll? Could we get 300 <laughs> patients in one year? Because if we can't do that, forget it. Two is could we reduce <clears throat> excuse me, could we reduce emergency room, could we reduce emergency room and hospitalizations within that first year by at least 2%. Now that doesn't sound like much, but the point is that's a lot of money at the end of the day. And then finally we're interested in quality improvement, but specifically quality of life. Could we help these patients with their quality of life? So getting to the results, what we did and what we found is we were able to enroll 323 patients. So we exceeded the enrollment in one year and we were able to improve their quality of life. Quality of life, the SIBDQ, which as you know is a validated score, went up to about 10 points, which again was fairly significant. And so these patients were better in terms of quality of life. And finally, and I think what most of us found intriguing is we are able to decrease emergency room and decrease hospitalizations by not just 2%, but nearly 50%. Wow. And when we look at the patients who had been in the medical home for at least six months, it still held about 40 to 45% reduction, which if you equate that in a dollar amount, is significant. So I think the take home message from this are new models of care are here. Um, Patient-centered medical home is one for the specialists, and I think IBD really lends to that. And we can improve quality, and we can also decrease ER and hospitalizations. And stay tuned. I have a feeling there will be other models. This isn't certainly the final one, right. but it's a very interesting concept. That's 
that's so terrific. And so what I'm what I hear is that this is feasible. Right. That the patients are on board with this. They're they're that they're choosing to participate, which yes. is going to clearly then make change possible, and that it's successful, as you've shown, and that it's durable. Right. Because it wasn't just a flash in the pan two weeks. This was six months. Right. And so the trifecta of, <laughs> yeah. of so, success. So, there. so far, so good, but we'll see. That's great. And uh, so I agree with your take home messages, and thank you for asking me about that. And we'll see what next year brings. But mm -hmm. with that, I wanted to thank you, Susie, for your time. That was wonderful. I learned a lot. <laughs> uh, it sounds like a great meeting with a lot of interesting best of day activities. Um, so, in conclusion, I would like to again thank the audience. Uh, that is the fourth and final segment of Best of Day ACG 2016. Thanks for enjoying ACG. Thanks for joining us, and hopefully you learned something in, through these interactions. Have a good day.